Hello and welcome to the program. I am Fola Shadi Ogurinde. Nigeria's inflation rate or CPI, that is Consumer Price Index, which measures the rate of change in prices of goods and services, have surged to 20.52% in August 2022. According to the National Bureau of Statistics, NBS, this is the highest since October 2005. Further analysis of the report show that food inflation rate has surged to its highest level in almost 17 years to stand at 23.12%, while core inflation rose to 17.2% in the same month. To speak more on this, Gospel Obele, Chief Economist and CEO of Streetnomics Limited, joins me now. Thank you very much for your time. Now, the surge in inflation rate from 19.64% in the previous month of July to 20.52% in August 2022 come as a surprise to you in any way? No, it doesn't come as a surprise. Um, and I'll definitely be surprised if it comes as a surprise to any, any serious or intentional Nigerian. And that's simply because we've seen the patterns, you know. Um, since January this year, we've seen a roller coaster of events, you know, that just simply informs um inf inflation was going to be in the worsening path part of that event would have would also mean would was also you know how the central bank sought to manage you know the, the worsening pathway of that inflation um uh, of the inflation figures and that was trying to use interest rate to curb inflation and it just simply backfired all right the argument would be by the central bank that um, economic variables or economic policies rather have a lag impact on variables meaning that if you make a policy today you may not be able to see the impact till like three months six months or one year however it's been over three months or almost close to six months now since the uh, central bank um you know made the first move to raise interest rates a couple of mpc meetings ago and we've seen that inflation has worsened on the month on month over time and these cost um, um figures or these cost realities you know sit at the core of the nigerian economy they sit at the core of manufacturing sit at the core of production permeate permeate through food gas you know energy prices and the likes we've also seen the conversion of the worst in foreign exchange rate um recently and what that would mean is that as you keep exchanging um naira for the dollar uh, at a very high price those that exchange value will permit back into your economy as an important inflation of some sort you know due to the high level of um, um dependency we have on imports and being also a primary consumption economy so we've seen the economics of the events in 2022 evolve and worsen inflation um down the path so i don't think anybody should be surprised with the way um the inflation numbers are faring now, we began the year with an inflation rate of 15.60% uh, in January 2022 and now currently stands at 20.52%. Now, what are the implications of this inflation surge for the Nigerian economy? So, I mean, let me first say that, to be very honest with you, the numbers we see right now that um, our, our inflation numbers are not our real inflation numbers. <laughs> mm -hmm. So if we, if we really decide to review the inflationary basket, the methodology, you know, to capture what our realistic inflationary numbers are, it's literally going to be minimum double what we have today. So that's first to the most important thing for me to say right now. Secondly, in view of answering the question, would be yes, a, a, a deepened cost of living crisis because inflation simply means, or inflationary rates moving up to 20% simply means that the pace of increase in prices has slightly gone higher. All right, so inflation does not mean um, um, if, if the percentage had decreased to 18%, it doesn't necessarily mean that prices have stopped going high. It just simply means that the pace or the rate at which prices are going high has slowed down. But what, you know, moving from 19 to 20% simply means that that pace had gone up. So what that simply means is that uh, the cost of doing business, the cost of living, the cost of running an economy has increased. All right, and those costs have permitted through major basic necessities of the average job, which is where the pain is, which is why the average job feels the inflationary pressure because the pressure permits through food, it permits through education, it permits through transport, it permits, permits through clothing, you know, and in some cases, water. All right, so if the average Nigerian um, is stuck trying to live through or get by, you know, the basic necessities, he or she may not be able to aspire for more or have the window to take on new opportunities, all right? So which would technically mean that the economy is getting poorer due to a worsening cost of living crisis. 
Now, we've seen that food inflation rate also rose to its highest level in almost 17 years to stand at 23.12%. Now, can you tell us why? Yeah, I mean, it's very, very clear for food inflation. Uh, one of the major um, impact of that has driven as worsening food inflation has been, number one, the increased cost of energy prices. You know, and because the way the Nigerian economy is structured, you know, our food economy sort of, all right, uh, uh, thrives heavily on an efficient logistics, transportation, supply chain, and mobility system. Now, all of that is crippled, you know, by the insecurity challenge. All of that is crippled by increased um, energy prices. Look at the price of tissu and all of that. You know, so by the time you have all this, multiply with the fact that you're not even producing enough to start with. You know, produces enough locally to feed your populace, you know, meaning that you now have to depend on imported feed items, you know, combined with what you can produce locally. If you look at all the economics of everything I mentioned now, inflation on food would always be on the high. You know, that's what it means. So with technically what it means also for the average uh, food business owner, it means that the cost of supply is higher, which would mean that the cost of food will also be higher. So and when the cost of food is higher for um, households and people who, who eat out of their homes, that would necessarily mean that consumers need to pay more just to eat on a daily basis. So it's now looking as though, you know, the average basic necessity are, are gradually becoming a, a um, how will I put it now, exclusive items to have, you know, until you make some kind of money, you may not be able to eat, uh, you know, very, very good three square meals a day. And that's quite worrisome. So we, we, we've seen the conversation around insecurity, poor logistics, you know, um, rising energy prices and poor economic management as well. Now, which brings me to the question of um, the agricultural sector, uh, which has not been able to fill uh, the food supply gap despite huge investments in the sector. What exactly is going on there? The big question is where are the investments going to? Hmm. You know, a lot of our investments are going to farmers' outgrower program and all those very important but highly trivial, you know, and maybe may not make a lot of impact on the value chain. What makes a lot of impact right now on the value chain is value processed items. You know, how much of your industry or how much of your industrial potential is being unlocked, right, to take in the raw materials from your agricultural sector, process them, and turn them into valuable products, goods, and services that can be consumed locally and that can compete for foreign exchange, you know, regionally and globally. That's the big question here. 90% of, of, of economic activities in the agricultural sector are in the, are in the crop production subsector. That doesn't make sense for any country who's seeking to really, really um, reduce food inflation to the best minimum. But definitely, we can't end this conversation without talking about Nigeria's heavy reliance on food importation, which has, of course, opened up the economy uh, to the global upsurge in prices experienced uh, by most economies. So how exactly can we bridge this gap, especially for a country like Nigeria? Right now, with the way things have really gotten very bad, we've gotten to a point where there are, no, there are relatively no quick fixes. We need to go back to the basis to get it right because any quick fix will bring us back to the problem. I didn't even forget. So any quick fix will bring us back to the problem. There is need for us to go and revisit the problem at the root causal level. First will be to unlock the agricultural value chain. Second will be to open up industrialization to be receptive, you know, to process raw materials into value add. And the third will be to begin to harness the potential of the non-oil sector. For exports, you know, for regional competitiveness and global competitiveness, until we can begin to do all the whole, all these things in in different pockets, do them effectively in different pockets, as well as holistically, you know, we may not be able to combat the inflationary crisis we have today. And also to add that the central bank trying to use interest rate to moderate inflation is 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 a dead on arrival move, and that's actually because the nature and construct of the inflation that we see today is not primarily monetary. It's more or less structural. Structural on the angle of energy, structural on the angle of you're not producing anything, structural on the angle of you're importing everything, structural on the angle that you're not coordinating your non oil sector properly you know, to scale foreign exchange receipts. So, until we fix the structural issues, maybe interest rate as a tool will begin to make sense in terms of collaborative engagement to drive down um, inflationary impact. 
Well, indeed, Gospel of Bele, Chief Economist and CEO, Streetnomics Limited, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for having me, for Shadi. Well, we'll take a break here and return with more on Money Matters to stay with us. Welcome back. More Nigerians are embracing the cashless policy of the Central Bank of Nigeria. In a recent data released by the Nigeria Interbank Settlement Systems, NIBSS, transactions worth 33.2 trillion naira were performed electronically in August through the NIBSS instant payment platform. The record for August is the highest e-payment value recorded in a month since the deployment of the platform in 2011. To speak more on this, I'm joined by Dr. Chijioke Ekechuku, Managing Director and Chief Executive, Dignity Finance and Investment Limited. Thank you very much for joining us. Now, in the month of August alone, transactions worth 33.2 trillion naira were performed electronically in August through the NIBS's instant payments platform. What do you make of this? When CBN um, started the cashless society, um, it was necessary that they backed it up with um, fintech uh, payment systems. And that has actually worked. And the target of CBN to ensure that there is inclusiveness of payment system and uh, banking transactions has also helped. And of course, Nigerians have tested um, the convenience of making payments electronically and nobody wants to once you have tested it um, you want to go back to the manual way of entering the bank and doing banking transactions for me i can't even remember uh, when i entered a banking hall last just because of the electronic uh, method of making payments and doing banking transactions i think um, it's a welcome development and you also know that um if you compare nigerian fintech with other countries of the world we are still up to uh, top, top 10, and that is just very encouraging that we are indeed doing well in our electronic uh, banking system. It is actually very convenient. It, it, it makes inclusiveness uh, possible, and um, it is convenient. Like I said, it, it, you, know, you can do any transaction at the comfort of your house, comfort of your, of your office. Now, you've spoken about the pros. Let's talk about the cons now. What are some of the challenges of using e-payments in Nigeria? You also know that some people don't want to get involved in it just because it makes them to spend more. It makes them to have access to funds all the time. Um, people, When people ask for money, it is ready to go. And so many people are not signed on to it because of that reason. There are some other issues about network in certain parts of the country that may not allow people to have access to electronic uh, banking and tra uh, financial tra transactions. You know, so these are the, some of them. And of course, you also know that um, because of the fraud involved in the IT area, um, it's also making uh, um, account holders vulnerable to all these hackers and all the things. We hear cases of people whose accounts have been um, swept completely just because of um, electronic uh, banking and electronic financial system. So those are some of the odds of this. And uh, But I think the benefits outweigh the odds. And uh, so we need to grow with that and uh, move forward. Now, how has the Nigeria Interbank Settlement Systems transformed electronic payments in Nigeria? It is very significant because um, if you take your mind backwards, say in the last uh, 20 years, um, when to, to make a payment to somebody up country, we used to call them up country. For example, I'm in Abuja and I want to make a payment to you in Lagos. It will take almost 21 years, 21 days to get your check, to get my check cleared. You know, 21 days of a payment. So if I had a business transaction with you, it would have taken us 21 days to consummate it. When you now receive value for your check, you will get back to me to say, I have received, you have received value. So we have saved time with this. We are already, you know, it gives you com com confidence that payment is made now and transaction can be consummated now without waiting for next three days, next 15 days, next, next 21 days. You know, so it is actually adding a lot to business growth and uh, we cannot uh, quantify it. 
Now, in terms of Nigeria's digital space, what impact has e-payment had on this sector? If you look at the size of entrepreneurship coming around the fintech space, you know a lot of um, um, fintech companies uh, are springing up every day. And you will not believe that in terms of uh, capitalization, um, it's a fintech company that is the most capitalized financial institution today in Nigeria, even when we have heavy banks that are existing. You know, so um, what it's doing right now is that people have access to payments, people have access to credit facilities online. And again, it's creating a lot of jobs. All these fintech companies that are springing up everywhere are also employing people and are adding a lot to employment and adding a lot to GDP of the country. You will see that in the last 10 years, uh, the GDP has grown in ICT um, area. Even when we are talking about uh, non-oil export or non-oil growth of our GDP, it, the ICT is contributing a lot in that in that space. So um, it has actually contributed a lot to the growth of our economy, which many of them were not even captured in calculating the, the GDP of the country. Once we capture all of them, our GDP, GDP should be more than what we are already uh, talking about today. So um, it has tremendously um, impacted us uh, positively, and uh, that is that's a, that's a, that's a welcome development. Now earlier you spoke about the challenges of e-payment, which vulnerability to scammers is a big part of. Uh, what must be done to ensure that users are protected? Yes. Yeah, fintech companies should fintech companies should also invest a lot of money in security, in their fintech security. You know, because um, the way they want to exonerate themselves when there is, um, uh, when, 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 when any account holder is defrauded through their system is very, uh, it's not very good. And so they should invest a lot of money in encrypting, encrypting their system so, so well that no matter what a hacker does, it will be difficult for them to, to hack into people's transactions and into people's accounts. So um, when they establish the fintech, they should also put in a lot of money in building a robust uh, security system to ensure that um, it will be difficult for people to, 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 to hack into. Um, it is uh, actually as important as establishing such platform uh, for, for payment system. So um, they have to do that. And people must be circumspect, circumspect in making um, online transactions. As much as possible, if there is any any request for payment, and you you need to actually ensure by following up in a conversation with the person, ensure that you are speaking to the person, ensure that the, the request actually came from the person uh, real, because um, we have seen situations where you just rely on communication online and you just move money. You must want to. It will be important for you to hear the voice of the person and let them discuss the transaction so that you are sure that you're making payment to the person. And so we need to be circumspect and, um, and be a little more cautious before we release payments to, to, to third parties. Well, indeed, Dr. Chijo K. Ekechuku, Managing Director and Chief Executive, Dignity Finance and Investment Limited. Thank you very much for your time and your contribution. Thank you very much. And it's a wrap on the program. See you again next time. I'm Fola Shadi. Have a great day. Bye for now.